our local newspaper sometimes provides a puzzle page for children. One of the puzzles is called Binoxo, and it has some very basic rules that allow for easy automation. It could be a nice exercise to let our 1401 solve this grid. Let's have a look at the rules. The first rule states that there may be at most two similar symbols next to each other, horizontally or vertically. This first rule helps with two different situations. First, if there are two symbols of the same type next to each other, they only may be surrounded by the other type. For example, these two crosses require adjoining circles. Second, if there is an empty field between two symbols of the same type, it can only be filled by the other type. For example, these two circles require a cross between them. The other main rule states that in each row or column there are five crosses and five circles. Following this rule, if there are already five symbols of one type, all remaining cells must be filled with the other type. The board can be solved by an alternating use of these three rules. First, find all twin symbols and surround them, until no more cases can be found. Second, find all symbols with a gap and fill the gap, until no more cases can be found. Third, look for rows or columns which have already five symbols of one kind, and fill the rest, until no more cases can be found. We can now simply repeat this procedure until the board is solved completely, or until there's no more progress if the board is not solvable. The board looks like an array, but computer memory is linear. It doesn't matter how you map the board to the memory, as long as there's an unambiguous relation. A standard solution would be to simply put the rows sequentially into memory, so a box can be located with a simple calculation. Now that we know how to address each box, it would be easy to write a short program to put an X into each box. There is no command to directly handle arrays on a 1401, so the most basic way would be writing a command for each box like this. But that's ridiculous of course. Every programmer would do this inside a loop. The only problem was, that in the first implementations there was no such thing like a pointer variable. Instead in the early days there was something that was even more scary than a go-to. Self-modifying code. Self-modifying code means that the parameter of one command in the program area would be directly altered. Like in this pseudocode example, the destination address of the copy command itself would be incremented. Today, on modern operating systems, this isn't even allowed anymore, as this would be considered malicious. Nevertheless back in time, this was a common procedure. I have prepared a real 1401 program, which demonstrates self-modifying code by filling the boxes with X's. Here is the command which copies the X to a box. Here is the command which adds one to the destination address of the copy command. And here is the command which checks if we already have reached 200 by checking the hundredth position of the copy address. I have already generated the object deck, and we can load the program. Here's the memory contents before the program run. Here at address 100 is the game field, and here at address 200 is the program. After running the program, we now have this data at address 100. And here we can see that the address used by the copy command has changed to 200. But this approach also had basic flaws. If you needed to execute many commands on changing locations, you had to change the address of all those commands. 
In our example, we may need to check two boxes for the symbol X, then check the two adjacent boxes for errors, and then set them to O. This would result in a whole bunch of commands, which only deal with setting the correct addresses. Fortunately, IBM knew that this is nonsense, and so you could order one of the special features, the so-called indexing. This was a very common feature, since you needed it for anything that was more complex than just adding some simple numbers on some punch cards. It allowed to add an offset to each command. You then only needed to change the offset once, and the CPU would add it automatically to each command. I used a simplified pseudocode for illustration purposes. The real 1401 program doesn't look much different. You get even three index registers, X1, 2, and 3. They are not really registers, but located directly in memory. For example, the X1 index is at locations 87 to 89. The 1401 uses an additional bit of the address to indicate the use of an index register. When writing the machine program manually, you have to look up the correct character yourself. If you are using autocoder, you may use an easy syntax, and the assembler will handle this for you. Afterwards, the 1401 will automatically add the index register to the base address to get the resulting location. Now that we have sorted out the basics, it's time to have a look at the Binoxo Solver program. The code starts with a lot of data definitions, and here comes the main program loop. It repeatedly calls the individual routines for the three rules, twin symbol, gap symbol, and five plus five symbols. It loops until the board cannot be further changed, either because it's solved or because it's unsolvable. To ease the programming, I've divided the routines for each rule into one for the horizontal case and one for the vertical case. As an example, Here's the routine to find all horizontal double symbols to surround them with the opposite symbol. Since we have many boxes to check and set, there's a massive use of the indexing feature. Here, you can see all the uses in this one routine. The loop now simply has to increment the X1 index accordingly to access the boxes. The same happens for the vertical double symbols, the horizontal and vertical gaps, and the horizontal and vertical 5 plus 5 case. Now let's load and run the program. Put in the object deck. Switch the 1401 into run mode. Reset the status. And press load. The program now offers us some options. We just go with the defaults and hit run again. When using the default, the program uses an internally defined demo field. Here we can see how it performed the search routines, added some symbols at certain positions, and printed the field state afterwards. After a few repeats of all routines, it finally stops. As we can see at the result, it was able to solve this field completely. There are some options. For example, you can suppress the output of the field after each step. And you can suppress the output of each detail during the steps. Checking these switches in the program is very easy, by using a branch command which directly depends on the switch position. The third option is to load a field from card, instead of using the built-in demo field. Let's punch this field.
put it into the card reader. Hit run. Flip the F switch. And hit run. And as you can see, it now solved the new puzzle. What happens if the field isn't solvable? Here is a program run where I've made a mistake when punching the cards for the field. It could still be solvable, but in this case, the program encountered a contradiction and stopped with an error message. If you want more details, you may repeat it with switches C and D in off position to get listed all steps. To get more fields for testing the program, simply Google Binoxo. You will find many examples. There are many formats, but keep in mind that this program only can solve 10 by 10 fields.